Well, are you ready to feast upon God's Word now? Uh, if so, let's take our Bibles and turn to Ephesians chapter 5. I want you to go ahead and mark your place there because that is the passage beginning in verse 21 that we are going to spend most of our time in today. Uh, so after you've marked Ephesians chapter 5, I then want you to travel to Genesis chapter 2 with me. Uh, so we're going to start our introduction in Genesis chapter 2, uh, and I just want to share with you, I've titled today's message, The Theology of Marriage. You think, well, today's Mother's Day. Why aren't you preaching a Mother's Day sermon? Well, I want to tell you, uh, I think that mothers, wives play an essential part in marriage because without them there wouldn't be a marriage, amen? Uh, so we have to have them. Uh, but there's another reason why I chose to speak on marriage this morning. Uh, it has been brought to my attention over the last month during this quarantine that there are a lot of marriages under attack. You say, well, pastor, marriages are always under attack. That is true. Uh, but it's been brought to my specific attention uh, that there are some that have come under different attacks during this time. Uh, and I want to make sure that we have a good, solid foundation that we sit our marriage on top of so that it can be all that God purposes for it to be. Uh, because our marriages exist to glorify Him. And we want to make sure that we're doing that. Uh, so there's a couple of foundational truths that we need to understand in order to fully appreciate and participate in marriage God's way. The first of those truths, and I know you will agree with me, church, is that marriage was God's idea. Uh, the reason I state that is why I had you go to Genesis chapter 2. So in Genesis chapter 2, if you will focus your attention at verse 18, I want to read from there through the end of the chapter. This is where God institutes marriage. It was his idea. It says, And the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. Out of the ground, of the, uh, out of the, ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. And whatever Adam called each living creature, that was its name. So Adam gave names to all cattle, to the birds of the air, and to, the, to every beast of the field, but to Adam there was not found a helper comparable to him. And the Lord God caused the deep sleep to fall on Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh in its place. Then the rib which the Lord God had taken from man he made into woman, and he brought her to the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. He shall be called woman because he was taken out of man. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And they were both naked, and the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. The reason why we use this text to say that marriage is God's idea is because we have a definition of marriage being laid out before us where a man is asked to leave his mother and father in a time when he didn't have a mother and father. So God is assigning definition. He's assigning purpose and meaning to the marriage covenant. As man and woman leave their mother and father and be joined together as one flesh in holy matrimony. One of the greatest things for us to recognize in our marriage is that it exists first and foremost for the, to display the love and the glory of God. First and foremost, Christian marriages... Your marriage exists to display the love and the glory of an almighty God. If you'll look back at verse 22 that we just read, it says, uh, The rib which the Lord God had taken from man, he made into woman, and he brought her to the man. I want to pose a thought here uh, for all of us to kind of meditate on for a moment. God, being that marriage was his idea, was the first father to ever give a woman's hand in marriage to a man. So if we just pause for a moment and think about that, men, what that means is you are God's son-in-law. And if you are God's son-in-law, then you will have to answer to him for how you treated his daughter. So I want you to just think on that uh, with the way that you carry out your role in marriage as a Christian man. Uh, as you have been given a woman from God to have as your wife. Verse 24, uh, we will see that God spoke 
marriage into existence through its design by saying, therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and they shall become one flesh. And fortunately, Paul uh, defined this or explained this to us in our text today in Ephesians chapter 5. Uh, and as you turn back there with me, uh, Mark chapter 10 verses 8 and 9 says, And the two shall become one flesh, so then they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore what God has joined together, let not man separate. So if we look at uh, Ephesians chapter 5, where we're going to spend the rest of our time this morning just kind of walking verse by verse through this marriage passage from the Apostle Paul, I want you to look down at the end, at verse 31 and 32, as Paul gives us the meaning behind Genesis 2.24. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 31, it says, For this reason, directly quoting from Genesis, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Here's the meaning, verse 32. This is a great mystery, but I am speaking to you concerning Christ and the church. There's a reason why God designed marriage the way that he did. When we have terms like has joined together and shall become one flesh, these are covenantal terms. These are lifelong terms. These are two human beings becoming one flesh, a man and a woman, joined together in one flesh. And what God has joined together, no one should separate. Why? Because marriage exists for the glory of God. Marriage exists to display the love of God in a covenant relationship between Christ and His church. It is a covenant relationship which means, and I want you to bear with me for a moment, this is a difficult truth for us to accept because we live in a, a here and now culture. We live in a me-centered culture. We live in a your happiness is the chief goal kind of culture. But I'm going to tell you, to have a marriage that is a covenant relationship, staying married does not mean staying happy. It doesn't even mean staying in love. Those are not things that you can base your covenant off of. Now, the reason I say that is because staying married... Through a covenant relationship means staying committed. It means keeping the covenant no matter what. Because it is a covenant relationship that represents such a greater love. Aren't you glad that, that God doesn't divorce us based off of performance? Uh, so we're, we're very thankful for that. This does not mean, and this is why I said you need to bear with me. I want to explain something to you. This does not mean that you just have to live miserably with the person that you're married to for the rest of your life. So I want to dig into that for, for a minute. Uh, it means that when you earnestly seek to honor the marriage covenant for the glory of God, God will give you a deep-seated joy that cannot be found anywhere else. This forces us to change the question that often gets asked in our culture. The question is, did I marry the right person? But when you find your joy rooted in Christ alone, you begin to ask the question, am I becoming the right person to be married to? So the focus changes because you're wanting to glorify God with the covenant relationship that he has allowed you to enter. I want to read a quote from Zig Ziglar. It says, I have no way of knowing whether or not you married the wrong person. But I do know that many people have a lot of wrong ideas about marriage and what it takes to make that marriage happy and successful. I'll be the first to admit that it's possible that you did marry the wrong person. However, if you treat the wrong person like the right person, you could well end up having married the right person after all. I lost my place. That was such a good point. Let's see. All right, got it. All right, however, if you treat, let me read that statement again. However, if you treat the wrong person like the right person, you could well end up having married the right person after all. On the other hand, if you marry the right person and treat that person wrong, you certainly will have ended up marrying the wrong person. I also know that it is far more important to be the right kind of person than it is to marry the right kind of person. In short, 
whether you married the right or the wrong person is primarily up to you. So we must recognize that the cultural idea of a soulmate has placed some unrealistic expectations on marriage. The soulmate or the you complete me mentality is based on what your spouse provides for you. It's performance based. What they provide for you emotionally, what they provide for you physically, and I'm going to tell you what that kind of view of marriage is. It's a trap of disappointment. Because uh, I learned a long time ago, uh, and I heard this from a pastor. He said, there's a great pivotal moment that comes in everyone's marriage when you realize that the sinner that you married married a sinner too. And so if you base your marriage on the performance of your spouse, that is a trap of disappointment. Instead, we should base it on the covenant of the Lord Jesus Christ that he has instituted between us. Expecting your spouse to complete you or completely fulfill you would put pressure on them that they cannot fulfill. Only Jesus Christ can completely fulfill my joy and sustain it. And when I look to him for that fulfillment, it frees me up to be who my spouse needs me to be. And so you see, a biblical view of marriage shifts the focus back on you and takes it off the performance of your spouse. If the idea of a soulmate existed, I want you to think of this too that everybody has this one certain person that is assigned for them, and they've got to search until they find that person, even divorcing other people to get to the right person, it would only take one person marrying the wrong person to mess it up for everybody in the world because of the domino effect. So we know that's not true. I just recently heard Vody Balkum make a comment uh, on a live broadcast I was listening to this weekend with my wife, and he said, you know how to know you married the right person? Make sure their name is the name on your marriage certificate. That's how you know that you married the right person. So I want to kind of transition into Ephesians chapter 5 this morning. How are we supposed to display the glory of God and his covenant love for marriage? The Apostle Paul in Ephesians chapter 5 defines the roles of wife and husband through comparing them to the roles of the church and Christ since it is that love that we're supposed to be displaying and representing. So let's look at Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21. Uh, and this is the time in the service where, I'm going to go ahead and have confession, where I've been asking all of you at home to stand up and never telling you you could sit down. All right, but since I have people in front of me this morning who are about to stand up, I'm going to be reminded to ask you to sit down today. So you can... You can post thank you in the comment section for that. So let's all stand to honor the reading of God's holy word. Beginning in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21. Submitting to one another in the fear of God. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as also Christ is the head of the church. And he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their wives, their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh." but nourishes and cherishes it, just as the Lord does the church. For we are members of his body and of his flesh and of his bones. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular so love his own wife as himself, and let the wife see to it that she respects her husband." Father, as we look at this text today, and as we lay the groundwork that a biblical marriage, a God-honoring marriage sits upon, a firm foundation found in Scripture, may you be honored. I, I pray right now for marriages that are in crisis. Our culture is in crisis, but when the family comes in crisis, we are really in trouble. Uh, Father, I pray that Christian marriages, under the sound of my voice, will understand the purpose of their marriage, 
the reason why it is important to fight for their marriage, Father, and their role in that marriage. May you be honored and glorified as we study this text. In Jesus' name, amen. Guess what? You may be seated. All right, so the first point that I want to make under studying Ephesians 5 is the point of mutual submission. All right, the marriage passage of Ephesians 5 often gets off to the wrong start because people start in the wrong place. And I'm going to tell you who's to blame for that. Study Bibles are to blame for that. Because in every study Bible I've ever looked at, they put the heading divider between verses 21 and 22. That's probably true of the Bible that you're looking at right now. Uh, That you would find a heading that starts the marriage passage at verse 22. But there's something that we miss if we don't start it in verse 21. Verse 22 starts with wives submitting to their husbands. But guess what verse 21 says? Husbands and wives should submit to one another. So we want to call this mutual submission in verse 21 that says submitting to one another in the fear of God. And I'll tell you, if we go even further back to verse 18, we will find that what empowers us to do that is first being filled with the Holy Spirit. So when two people are filled with the Holy Spirit and they submit to one another in the roles that the Bible has set out for them, their marriage will be honoring to the Lord. Submitting to one another in the fear of God. The concept of mutual submission of verse 21 does away with the misconception that marriage is a 50-50 investment. The 50-50 mentality destroys many marriages today because under the you give 50, I give 50, we've got several problems. Number one, performance becomes the glue that holds the relationship together. Secondly, affection is based off of the other person earning it. Third, motivation to invest in the relationship is based off of feelings, not off of commitment. And then fourth, resentment builds when one spouse doesn't do their part. And I've just listed many of the reasons why marriage is broken today. Why it ends in divorce is because I did my part, but you didn't do your part. Let me tell you what mutual submission does to the 50-50 rule. It changes it to a 100-100 rule. I will give 100%. My wife will give 100%. And if one of us falls short in what we're investing in the marriage, the other one is giving enough to make up for it. That is what mutual submission talks about. It is the mentality uh, that, that says, I'll do enough for the both of us even when you don't fill up to it. So what does that look like in the individual roles of the covenant relationship? What is mutual submission, a wife submitting to a husband and a husband submitting to a wife in the roles that are set out in Scripture? Scripture is very clear, first and foremost, that men and women are equal in value. But I want you to hear me, church, not equal in roles. So let let me define that to you for a moment. Galatians chapter 3, verse 28, is just one of many passages that says we are equal in value. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. But even though we are equal in value, we have been assigned different roles in the biblical marriage relationship. And those roles complement one another. This is a doctrine called complementarianism where there's been a role assigned that can only be fulfilled by the man, and there's been a role assigned that can only be filled by the woman, and those roles complement one another for the glory of God. That teaching is under attack in the church today, uh, saying that that we do away with that, that that has uh, given rise to abuse and, and other things. But this is not talking about value. This is talking about displaying the love and the glory of an almighty God who designed it that way. And I don't know about you, as a, as a man, you might be able to relate uh, that when you try to put something together without reading the instructions, it doesn't work properly. You have parts left over that, that you don't know what they're for. So it would make sense if we've been given an instruction manual on how to put our marriage together to say that if you follow these instructions, this is how it will work properly, the way that it was designed by its inventor then it would make sense to read those instructions. And we have just done so in Ephesians chapter 5. So let's start where Paul started in verse 22 with the role of the wife. 
It says in verse 22 through 24, Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is head of the wife, as also Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. As Paul paints a word picture here of the relationship between Christ and his church, he assigns the role of the church to the wife, and he assigns the role of Christ to the husband. Those are our reference points when trying to discover how we should fulfill our roles in the marriage. The wife looks to the church, the husband looks to Christ himself. For the wife, the best way to understand the command of verse 22 to submit is to look at how it is translated in verse 24. So in verse 22, the verb is translated submit. But in verse 24, it is translated subject. And that really encompasses what the role of the wife is to do. The verb to be subject to or to subject oneself to means to willingly relinquish one's rights to a position. Now remember a result of the fall in Genesis 3. She's going to want that position. Subject yourself to means you willingly surrender the rights to that position because you know it doesn't belong to you. And you do so in the honor of God, your heavenly Father. Uh, As to the Lord is another very important piece of the puzzle because that means a wife's submission to her husband is not out of obedience to him, but out of obedience to who? The Lord. That eliminates the excuse, I would be more willing to submit or subject to him if he was doing his part. Well, the Bible also speaks to that in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 1. Wives, likewise, be submissive to your own husbands, that even if some do not obey the word, they without a word may be won by the conduct of their wives. And so wives continuing to fulfill their role continues to glorify God in that role. The motivation for submitting to your husband is the recognition that the Lord has given him the position of headship in the family. So look at verse 23. It says, The husband is the head of the wife, as also Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. When a wife recognizes that her husband is accountable for his entire family before God, here's what she comes into the realization of. He's going to need my help. Amen, men? Uh, God says it is not good for man to be alone because he is going to mess it up if he is left alone. So he's going to need the wife's help. That's why God created for Adam a helper. This title, helper, has been assigned to two different people and two different beings in the body. It's been assigned to the wife, as we saw in Genesis 2. It's also been assigned to the Holy Spirit. It's it's an enabling role. Uh, I often view it as like a, like a kickstand on a, on a bicycle. That when you remove that kickstand, the bicycle falls over. Well, that happens for a Christian when you, uh, if the Holy Spirit were not present. It also happens for a husband if his wife were not present. It's an enabling role. It's a, it's a helpmate role. The husband can do what God has commanded of him only when he has a helper within him, the Holy Spirit, and when he has a helper beside him, his wife. The model example for the wife to follow is the church in verse 24. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Just as the church keeps Christ at the center of her attention and strives to honor and respect him in all that she does, so should the wife to her husband. Just as the church is accountable to Christ in everything, so should the wife be to her husband. Just as the church represents Christ everywhere she goes, so does the wife to her husband. Being subject to your husband in all things means that you always recognize that he has to give an account for you and your family and your behavior and your decisions before God one day, and you help him in that endeavor. Then Paul, in verse 25, makes the shift to the role of the husband. 
After showing that the submission of the wife is an enabling role and a a help and assistance that the husband needs to be who God has called him to be and to answer on her behalf one day before God, uh, then he gets to the role of the husband comparing his role to the role of Jesus Christ. Look at verse 25 with me. It says, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as the Lord does the church. For we are members of his body and of his flesh and of his bones. The Apostle Paul makes a shift again in the translation of the verb of the text. Remember, the the key verb is submit. He's already changed it to subject, still keeping in that submission framework, but now he's going to change it to love. So when he gets to the husband, the focus of the passage that we just read is how a husband, in submission, can fulfill the call to love his wife the way Christ loves the church, and has loved the church. Once again, Paul gives us an illustration of what this love should look like by comparing it to what Christ has done. It says, husband, love your wives. Just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. Matthew 20, 28 says, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many, this call to love our wives is a call to servant leadership. It's a call to love through service, to serve our wives the way Christ has served the church. And one of the greatest ways that a husband can serve his wife is by laying his life down for her. Now I'm going to stop for a minute and I'm going to eliminate a misconception that husbands have here where they really let themselves off the hook. There are Christian husbands that say, yeah, I'd be willing to take a bullet for my wife. I'd be willing to stand in front of an attacker for, for my wife. I'm going to tell you, if you wouldn't, you're a sissy, okay? So if, if you didn't do that, I would take your man card from you. But that's not what this text is talking about. Instead, for a husband to be willing to lay his life down for his wife is he is willing to take the fall for her actions. He is willing to suffer all of the consequences so that she wouldn't have to. Think about what Christ did for us on the cross. He didn't just take the hit for us. He paid the full price for us. He took the consequences of our sin upon himself and he paid them in full. Are you willing to do that for your wife? It's what we're called to do, to love our wives as Christ loved the church and to lay ourselves down for her the way he has laid himself down for us. We are commanded to do the same. My wife's, uh, but it it doesn't stop there. It, It goes beyond that. It doesn't just say be willing to lay your life down for her. It also says that her spiritual health is your responsibility. So look at, look at that. It says, uh, verse 26, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. My wife's spiritual health is my responsibility. I'm commanded to wash her with the Word of God. Husbands should study and seek to know what the Word says about their wife's struggles instead of passively watching as Adam did in Genesis 3, playing an active role in leading his wife and his children. We have been called to play an active role in our wives' spiritual life. Husbands should love their wives through sacrificial service. Husbands should love their wives through purifying them with the word. And husbands should love their wives, verse 28, as they care for themselves. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just as the Lord does the church. For we are members of his body and of his flesh and of his bones. So we must love our wives to the extent that we care as much for her welfare as we do our own. 
Paul, uh, I'm going to stop right there too. When Paul says, love your wife as you love yourself, he's assuming a high level of self-care. Because I've seen some of you guys. Uh, let's just stop there. All right. So Paul is assuming a high level of self-care that you would care for yourself and you would do nothing. A husband who loves his wife in this way would, would no more do anything to harm his wife than he would to harm his own flesh. Instead, his desire would be to nourish and cherish her. When she needs strengthening, guess what he would do? He would strengthen her. When she needs encouragement, He would give her encouragement. When she needs a listening ear, he would listen. When she needs to be held and comforted, he is there. And such is the case with anything else that she needs for her own well-being. It's the husband's responsibility. Husbands have been called to be the protector and provider of his wife's spiritual, physical, and emotional needs. And it is for that reason that you have verse 31. For this reason, a man shall leave his mother and his father, or his father and his mother, and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Now I want to make one final point here, and that is that the chief end of a Christian marriage is to display the gospel. So so let me read verse 33, and then I want to pose a challenge to you. Verse 33 says, Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular so love his own wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Here's the challenge that I want to assign to, to every marriage that's listening to this sermon. Can the people around you, and I want to include your children in this, can the people around you observe your marriage the way you as a husband and the way you as a wife interact with one another and hear the gospel and see the gospel of Jesus Christ and His church? Does your marriage relationship share the gospel? Does it evangelize to everyone who gets to observe it? Is it any different from a worldly, self-centered, satisfaction-driven marriage that we find in our culture? Is it rooted in Christ alone to display His love and His glory? That's the framework. That's the the platform or the foundation that you sit your marriage on top of that will be unshakable. It's a covenant-keeping relationship because the salvation that we have in Christ Jesus is a covenant kept by Him, and there is nothing that can snatch you out of His hand. Nothing. What God has joined together, let no man separate. So I want to invite Jeremy and Jess to come back up. They are going to lead us in a closing song. Uh, How Great Thou Art, beautiful hymn about the greatness of God. We want you to sing this with us. We also want you to respond. If, If your marriage is under attack right now, which I'm sure it is, let's just think for a moment. If if marriage exists for the purpose of displaying the gospel, then what would Satan want to attack that would have the greatest impact on the way the world views the gospel? He would attack marriage. And so we know that Christian marriages are under attack. Make sure that your marriage is sitting on the biblical foundation that God intends for it to be built upon. With a covenant love, displaying the love and the commitment and the glory of an almighty God. We're praying for you. Uh, We hope that you will uh, take this message to heart, that you will apply it. And I'm going to tell you, if you're listening today and you're not married, you have just received some great premarital counseling uh, that, that you can use as a platform and a launching pad for whatever God may have in your future. Let's honor Him with our marriages.
Let's bow our heads together, and then we'll close with a song. Father, we are grateful that you have not set us on this earth to figure things out on our own. But instead, you have given us an instruction manual to use to glorify you with what we have been called to do. This Bible is your holy word, every bit of it from Genesis to Revelation. And it's been given to us to read so that we can use our life and our marriage and our relationships and our talents and our gifts to best glorify you in obedience. You've given us the instructions. You've given us the the framework. We would honor you to obey and follow those instructions. I pray once again that the marriages that are under attack, Lord, that that you would move back to the center where you belong and that you would call husbands and wives to the roles that you have set before them and that you would draw their hearts together toward one another as you draw them closer to you. May you get all the credit for that. Lord, thank you for this time that we have spent in your word. And as we respond to it through application, may you be glorified. In Jesus' name, amen.